Well, good morning and welcome to our final week in Monumental Moments in the Old Testament. And this week, we hit on another classic. And uh, as I was processing this sermon and reflecting on the series, uh, Adam and Eve, Noah, the, the Tower of Babel, Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego last week, uh, out of these seven weeks that we've touched on so far, three of them have been major movies or a Broadway hit. So we've been doing pretty good. And then last week, uh, and actually this week as well, they are a major Veggie Tale show. So uh, there is that as well. Uh, so I think we have done. I think we've done pretty well in choosing and picking these monumental moments in the Old Testament. And let me add that there are a lot of great stories that we have not discussed, a lot of them. And so don't think that just because we didn't talk about it uh, that it's not important. It's only that I'm really cherry picking a select few of these stories that I think we reference a lot in church uh, sermons. And so I also had to keep it to just the top eight. So also, also along with that, there is a lot of good stuff within all of these stories. I mean, when we look at Jonah this week, uh, we are talking about Jonah and the whale, and there is so much good stuff in Jonah. I have actually done an entire series on the book of Jonah. Uh, and did one chapter each week to put together a four-part series in the book of Jonah. And even then, there's still more to glean from it. It's just that richly packed. Um, and, and especially since I've returned from Israel, there's even more that I see in it now because I've been there. Uh, so believe me when I say... We are going to be running through an entire book again. We're running through it high level, real quick going through it. Uh, but I'm going to give you guys a few teaching moments, kind of as my point as we go through it. So you'll understand as we get there. So let's go ahead and jump into Jonah. The book of Jonah, it was named after the man who we believe wrote it. Jonah, who is called by God to go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up to me. And so that is how this book starts off. Again, this, this dream situation that we think of where God shows up and tells Jonah exactly what to do. Listen, here's what I want you to do. And so we would get excited about God showing up and saying, here's what I want you to do. And so we would expect that Jonah, the very next thing that Jonah would do is say, yes, Lord, whatever you ask, because we know that if God showed up and told us to do something, we would be all in, right? Uh, hmm, right? So, so what did Jonah do? Well, let me read what Jonah did. Uh, chapter 1. Verse 3, it says it this, it says it this way. It says, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. In other words, Jonah commanded to head East did what unfortunately some people are still doing today and headed west. Now, like always, I like to give you a little bit of context. And as I said earlier this week, we're going to provide teachable moments as well. So uh, first, the context. Let me, let me give you a picture. Here is a picture of me in Joppa. If you look on a map, Joppa, or today as it's known as Jaffa, this city is located just south along the coast of the Mediterranean, just south of Tel Aviv. And I was actually a little surprised when we showed up here. Um, I didn't, didn't know. I just, 
I just didn't expect ever to come across a place in Israel from the Old Testament that was still like in existence today. I mean, it, it was just crazy when we showed up there and they told us where we were because when we think about that, the recorded evidence of this city dates back as far as the 15th century BC. So this city is like 3,500 years old. And that's just crazy to think that it's still there. People are still living there. But in fact, uh, I would call it a suburb of Tel Aviv. It's really that close. There's really no interruption from the city. But uh, as you can see from the picture, I am standing in front of a whale. And then when I turn the camera around, I want you to notice that it is down to get to the port, which two things, uh, the port is down and to the right around that building. So I think that falls in with the scripture of, of uh, Jonah going down. It explains that. And then secondly, a little known fact for us, even today, Jaffa is still a functioning port. It is one of the oldest functioning ports in the world, one of the oldest functioning harbors. And although today it really only harbors small fishing boats, it's still there. It's still being used. So I thought that was really cool. So anyways, it is into this setting that Jonah comes into when he chose to flee from the Lord. So regardless of where Jonah started out, we don't really know where he started, but uh, because this is on the west coast, right up against the uh, Mediterranean Sea, he had to travel west to get there. And again, context, Nineveh was east, so Jonah, you're going the wrong direction. And in the book of Jonah, direction is important. It's extremely important. As Jonah runs away from God, we see in these chapters, we see him going down, down to Joppa, down to the port, down into the ship, going in the opposite of direction, heading west when God is telling him to go east and he's going down. And, and just another important note here, look at verse 3. Uh, I, I know this is crazy. We're only on verse 3. I don't know how we're going to do this. Uh, I told you there's really a lot of good stuff in here. So look at verse 3. Verse 3 says this, But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. And now, listen to this. This is, where I want you to, this is what I want you to hear now. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And I think that that is significant to point out that he paid the fare because it, it reminds us, uh, call this a teaching point number one, that sin costs. Sin costs. Sooner or later, if you choose to sin against God, it will cost you something. And for Jonah, running from the Lord cost him the price of the ticket to sail to a city that he would never make it to. That's only a small part of what it cost him, and we'll get to more of that in a minute. But the question then for us is, what has sin cost you in your life? And I'm sure we can all think of an answer to that question, uh, but we're going to keep moving here because we've got a lot to cover. So Jonah, he jumps in the boat, they head off, a big storm hits and these big, strong, experienced sailors begin to freak out. They begin to throw cargo overboard to lighten the ship. And now Jonah's sin also is costing the sailors too. Uh, I would stop and discuss that, but you guys will have to work on that one yourself. So moving on. So they find out that Jonah is to blame for the storm. And so this chapter ends as Jonah, uh, in chapter 1, verse 15 and 17, uh, 15 through 17, it says, Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard into the raging sea. And the raging sea grew calm 
At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. You know, I am guessing, I'm assuming here, but I'm guessing being in the belly of a great fish would lend some time for reflection, right? I mean, this is literally forced quiet time, if you will. Uh, God-appointed solitude, right? Um, it's obvious that he probably would not have the opportunity to scroll through Facebook. I doubt the Wi-Fi is very good. Uh, I doubt he would have been updating his Instagram once in those three days. Uh, but, <laughs> sorry. But seriously, um, I, I, I think my second teaching point, if you will, would be about this idea of this forced solitude. Uh, don't force God to make you follow him. Uh, if he's calling you into a time of silence or and or solitude and or service, y you might want to listen because if God is calling you, he has something planned for you. And so you would be well advised to listen. Okay, so it's during this time that Jonah is left with some time to rearrange priorities as he's in the belly of the whale. And it is during this time that he constructs this beautiful prayer that we have in chapter 2. In fact, almost all of chapter 2 is this prayer that Jonah writes. It is beautiful, a powerful, powerful prayer. So let me read this prayer to you uh, in chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 2 through 9 and just, just try to grasp what Jonah is praying and saying in this prayer. Jonah chapter 2, starting in verse 2. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave I called for help. And you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas. And the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threaten me. The deep surround me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains, I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Man, what a powerful and beautiful prayer. I would, I would say, listen, read this a couple times this week. Uh, this is one of those passages that I think after you've had a bad day or a bad week, mm, this passage could just really speak into those moments. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Look, I, 
I want to point out the direction thing that I was talking about earlier, how direction is so significant in this passage. Uh, we talked already about Jonah running from the Lord and that he went down to Joppa, down into the ship. Uh, he was, and then he was thrown overboard and went down into the water and into the great fish. And then we read this prayer. Down into the heart of the sea, right? Down into the heart of the sea, down uh, to the root of the mountains. And then in verse 6, look at verse 6. To the root of the mountains. This is the transition verse in this book, if you will. Uh, you'll hear, listen for the, for the directions for the transition part. Jonah chapter 2, verse 6. Transition, here we go. To the roots of the mountain I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, O Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. And then it's from here that Jonah gets vomited up onto land. See this transition of going from down, 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 down to up, 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 up. Remember I said Jonah is a book of directions and we need to pay attention to them. Going from down as he runs from the Lord to up as he follows. From heading west to now going east. From running from the Lord to being obedient, which is what we see in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I will give you. And then verse 3, it says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. I, I think... I think this is significant too. Maybe call this uh, teaching point number three in this. The third thing that maybe can show us some, some hope is this. Listen, listen, Jonah has been running away from God, disobedient, sin, trying to do his own thing. And finally, finally, when he hits rock bottom, God brings him up and gives him a second chance, right? The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And I think this is great evidence that our God is a God of second chances. That God gives us second chances. But again, let's learn from Jonah. Let's follow the first time, right? Let's not work to end up where Jonah ended up so we can get a second chance, right? Let's follow the first time. But also know that when we screw up, when we mess up, that God is a God of compassion and will give us a second chance. So Jonah, receiving this second chance, heads off to the big city, the big and wicked city of Nineveh. And the Bible talks about how big this city is and that it would take three days to walk from one side to the other. And so Jonah goes and he walks one day through the city. He announces that 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. And then Jonah leaves, goes outside the city, crawls up a hill, sits down and waits to see what would happen to the city. Now, here's the crazy part about this book, that Jonah's one-day proclamation in the Bible, it says in verse 6, when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh, by the degree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God 
may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And I find this significant because nowhere does it say that Jonah went and talked to the king. In fact, it seems even seem strange that the king doesn't have someone fetch Jonah to make sure he's got the story straight. But yet instead, the king just hears, gets up, and issues this proclamation. I mean, Jonah converts the whole city. What an amazing accomplishment. In one day, with one simple proclamation to repent. And everyone does. Jonah is the most successful prophet ever recorded. And so what do we read in chapter 4? Verse 1. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarsus. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Oh, the horror. God, how could you be gracious and compassionate? How could you be slow to anger and abounding in love? I mean, can you believe this guy? Verse 3, Now, O Lord, take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And we sit here and think, you've got to be kidding me. It is better to die than to live? Are you serious? Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. You see, Jonah failed to learn our fourth teaching point that I want to talk about this morning that is found throughout the book of Jonah. You see, God spared the sailors when they pleaded for mercy during the storm. God saved Jonah when he prayed in chapter 2 from inside the big fish. God saved the people of Nineveh when they responded to Jonah's preaching. Listen, teaching point number four, God answers the prayer of those who call upon him. I mean, God will always work his will and he desires that all come to him to trust in him, to be saved. And we too can experience this love and compassion and be saved if we heed God's warnings to us through his word. If we respond in obedience, God will be gracious and we will receive his mercy and not his punishment. Listen, God can do amazing things through his people. Where is God calling you? What direction are you headed? How can you follow him more closely? How can you become more obedient to Christ? Listen, let me encourage you this week with a variation of Jonah's prayer. If you feel as though your life is ebbing away, remember the Lord. Reach out to Him and worship Him in His holy presence. Let's pray this morning. Almighty Father, we often struggle with following you. But Lord, we ask that we be given those nudges to turn around, to change our direction, to follow you, to chase after you, to walk closer with you each and every day. God, continue to guide and direct us, continue to show us our path, and give us the strength to follow it. 
each and every day of our lives. And Lord, when things are a struggle, when we find ourselves in the belly of a great fish, let us cry out to you and seek your face. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, again, I thank you for joining us. Remember, uh, I want to remind you again, next week, Next week will not be a live stream. It will be up on Monday, though. I hope if I can get everything around uh, because Ben Tobias will be here to talk to us about missions. So until then, I hope you guys have a great week and God bless.